We've all heard the phrase that birds of a feather flock together. And that's absolutely fact in the world of high performance sports. The elite consistently audit their circles and surround themselves with others that are elite or on a trajectory to that. They play with the best, hang with the best, and they train with the best. High performance athletes and the greats of all time have consistently seen their performance on the field, on the court, as a top priority to invest in when they're not at practice or in the game. My conversation today is with a gentleman who's one of the best of the best in the world of training and developing high-performance athletes around speed, agility, and strength. He uses his knowledge and experience to train thousands of aspiring professional athletes or current athletes in leagues like MLB, NBA, NFL, and NHL, pushing them all to reach their peak performance and the vision that they have for their life. Welcome to At The Podium. Hello again, and welcome to At The Podium with Manuel Mesqua. I'm a financial advocate, CEO, husband, father, and massive sports fan. I'm obsessed with encouraging people to dream and attack their unique vision for their life so that they can inspire others to do the same. I built this podcast specifically to share the stories of some of the highest performers in my life and help convert those stories into lessons to help you get closer to your dreams and the vision you have for yours. Folks, today my guest is Jim Kilbasso. Jim has trained thousands of aspiring professional athletes and active athletes at all levels of competition in various sports ranging from the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL. He's the owner of Impact Sports Performance based out of Novi with locations in Brighton and East Lansing. He's also the president of the International Youth Conditioning Association and a sports performance business consultant well-known across the country. He's a man of great knowledge and author of three books. I loved hearing about so much from Jim, but a couple of the things that really stood out to me was we've got to provide people an exceptional training experience. We've got to deliver information without emotion, and we've got to be investing in others who know how to do it at a high level. He referenced Joe Ehrman's book, Inside Out Coaching, and so much more. I know you'll find value in today's conversation. Enjoy my time with Jim Kilbasso. So we're here today with three-time author, a high-performance coach around speed, agility, and strength to some of the top performers in sports, the owner of Impact Sports Performance, and president of the International Youth Conditioning Association. We're here today with Coach Jim Kilbasso. Jim, thanks for being with us. So happy to be here. We were just laughing earlier, as you walked in, we start talking about a number of the mutual relationships we have in common. And I'm only in Michigan six years. And so we're kind of chuckling at how much overlap we have with the people that are in our lives. You mentioned who, and then he walks in the door one minute later. That's me. Like, that's my story. That's all the time. Like, oh, you know this person, you know this person. And it's, that's just kind of what I enjoy doing. And you and I have a lot of mutual connections, which is really, really cool. We went through the list, and I'm sure we could dig even deeper into that if we wanted to. So you mentioned Connor Cruz, and then he just literally walks in the door yep. a second later. So that's awesome. Obviously, you've dedicated your life to sports. Really excited to unpack a number of different topics, especially that. But like with all of our guests, everything seems to start somewhere. And I love hearing and sharing with our listeners about your childhood. 
Can you tell me some of the things that really stand out to you from your childhood that you reflect on today and say, man, that was a really meaningful part of how I am and who I am today? I'll say this too now that I am a father of three boys and a couple of them are already out of the house and seeing what they're doing. I think we do have some influence on kids, but some things are just born in certain kids. I did, my parents had n- no interest in business. They were both professors, teachers at Michigan State. And I just had like a passion for business. They weren't like at the time really into working out. I developed that. The sports that I got into, my parents weren't really into. I don't know. Sometimes you just kind of get into things. I grew up in Okemos right by East Lansing. I wanted to be Magic Johnson growing up. Got to see him play, would practice the baby hook in my backyard and mostly Nerf hoop though. And I realized at a certain point that I wasn't going to be the next Magic Johnson, but that was like kind of my childhood dream. As I got into sports and then I also got into like shows, I had lots of talent, but I really loved the training part more than the sports. I loved strength training and sprinting and jumping and all that stuff. Before it was really, really happening for, for athletes. Loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. Didn't really have the coach that I wish that I would have had that would have grabbed me and said, look, man, like you've got some talent. Here's what you need to do. I'm going to take you down this path. Mm -hmm. Never had that. And I think that that's kind of why I do this now Mm -hmm. to kind of be the coach that I wish that I would have had, because who knows what I would have been able to do. I know I wasn't going to be the next Magic Johnson, but who knows what, you know, what would have happened. My high school career was kind of like high school musical. So like I was, I was in sports and then I got to be the lead in our show. It happened to be Greece and all my friends that were athletes like joined and were like in the gang, just like high school musical, I swear to God. And like, they were all dancing doing grease lightnings. It was literally like high school musical. It was, it was really fun. That also gave me a different appreciation for some of the stuff that I do, how how we move. As I got into dance, which was actually my minor in college, I really got into how the body moves and how coordination works and started thinking, well, if we can if we can do this for dance and figure out how to be more coordinated in combinations and moving in a different way, we've got to be able to do that for athletes. And at the time, people weren't really teaching speed and agility. And that is part of what got me into teaching speed and agility. And that is what my first book is about. My book was the first book to kind of really unpack for coaches how to teach speed mechanics. So that was the motivation there in a, in a strange way because it kind of came from another world. I want to come back to a comment you made about not having had that coach. Oftentimes I think about whether it was growing up in sports, played sports through to a division three level in college. And and in in those like 15 years of my life from middle school through college, like that was my identity, was being an athlete. I was thankful that even for the mediocre potential I had as an athlete, I have a number of coaches who were in my life that said, hey, I see this for you. Mm -hmm. I know you may not see this, but I see this for you. And that really, I think, has had an enormous impact on who I am today. It sounds as if you had a slightly different experience. When you look back on yourself as a student athlete then, I mean, you coach people in four of the five major leagues, NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL. Was there a sport that you wish somebody had seen something for you that you could have dedicated more intentional time and effort to developing yourself as an athlete? Well, basketball, because I said I wanted to be yeah. Magic Johnson. You look more like Scotty Skiles. Uh, okay, all right, all right, I can I, I could take that one. That maybe uh, would have been a better goal probably for me. I, I played a lot of soccer. I did some track. I, I really do wish somebody would have grabbed me in track because that's what I do now. You know, I do speed training, and at the time it conflicted with other things that I was doing in my life. But I wish that I would have also gotten to play football. I wasn't kind of allowed to play football because I also played the drums. And I decided the football coach, the soccer coach, but they wouldn't allow me to play two sports. So I was kind of like, all right, well, then I won't play a sport and I'm going to be in marching band my freshman year. And then I, I stopped that and played soccer. And soccer was a huge sport in my in my community and football was not as much. So and all my friends were playing soccer. So I so I picked that. But I, I asked I wanted to do both. And maybe that would have been too much. But yeah, so I guess I kind of regret that a little bit. 
I wish somebody would have said, we can work with you. We can w- make this happen. But I mean, it, that was kind of like how you sports is now. You know, yes. you, you, so many people have to make a choice early on in their sports careers. Like, oh, you want to play soccer? Well, you got to quit everything else. You want to play volleyball? You can't, you know, do basketball. And that's a huge problem, I think, right now in with youth sports. I want to talk about that because 90% of our conversations with high performers like yourself, it's, it's folks in and around sports. It doesn't mean it has to be only the athlete playing on the on the field or the court, but it's all folks in and around sports at a very high level. And we've developed a huge listening base with parents yeah. of current student athletes. They're going to be excited to listen to this conversation. What What is your perspective on that? A, a student athlete demonstrating some real gift and talent for a sport and then narrowing in only on that sport at such a young age. I dislike it. The research does not say that that's the right approach. The research on long-term athlete development actually shows that the highest performers down the road put in more hours in sports other than the one that they actually become elite at before age 14. Around age 14, stuff starts getting cut out. But the people who stayed with just one sport and they specialize only in that at a young age, they can be good. They don't become as elite as the people that played multiple sports. The issue, though, is that, I mean, you're you're a parent. You want your kid to succeed now. And so Mm -hmm. parents are more concerned with their kid winning the game this, this weekend at 10 years old than they are thinking long term. No 10 year old is going to achieve his or her, you know, potential in sports, at least that doesn't come until at past 18, but we're so consumed with, well, my kids got to perform this weekend so that they can make the team and they can stay on the team or they can enjoy sports. And really it's the long-term approach that needs to be taken. And, and even more so what I see is that a lot of parents and now coaches, it's a, a huge thing has changed in the last 10 years where it's all about skill development, especially at an early age. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't develop skills, like do your pitching lessons and dribble the ball and shoot it and practice all these things. But the window for developing all around athleticism, body control, coordination, speed, agility, that closes way earlier in an athlete's career than the ability to improve skills. The idea in a perfect world would be to develop a wide base early on of athleticism. Then athletes can take that athleticism and they can apply it to the sports skills later on in their lives. If you try to invert that and work only on skills early on, but you don't develop the athleticism, it's very difficult to take, say, someone that's not as gifted athletically, but really good at their skill and turn them into an athlete. It's almost impossible. And you see those kids that are really good in the Little League World Series, they're not pitching in the regular World Series. Almost never. Very, very rarely does that happen. It's people who take a little bit longer approach. Can we unpack athleticism a little bit? Being the father of a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old right now, obviously I'm their father, so I think they're amazing, right? Uh, As as we should all think, right? But they they are exceptional student athletes. And and I think that gives me great pride in knowing that they Mm -hmm. attempt to do a good job of juggling, being a servant leader and a great teammate every day, caring about school, and then caring about how they show up on their team. What's the advice you would give me around how can I take the word athleticism and maybe box it in a little bit to four or five things that I could be providing them as a runway to develop their athleticism at the age they're at right now? What are the things that I should be helping provide access to so that they develop athleticism? Coordination, which is going to come from doing lots of different things, playing other sports, playing games in the backyard, playing catch, doing things that aren't necessarily an organized sport. That right there is a huge issue. Kids don't do unorganized things anymore. If you're if a kid's going to play sport, it's like, all right, you got to take me to practice and there's going to be a coach there who's going to set it all up yeah. and make it perfect. You just don't see kids making up rules in the backyard and making up games as much anymore. Uh, a soccer club told me that they understand that they that the kids need to do other games and other things. And they said, if you come in and do it, the parents will look at you and and think like, oh, there's a reason that they're doing this. They said, if we do it as soccer coaches, parents look at it and say, I'm not paying for this. This is a waste of time. Teach my kid how to play soccer. It's almost comical, yet it's sad, you know, at the same time. So if you can get your kids to do other things, it's really dependent on like, 
who's in the neighborhood. Does the parent have time to like go out there and do some stuff if they're not getting it elsewhere? Is their coach going to allow it to happen? And I think most coaches now, at least in youth sports, they say they want kids to play other sports, but when it comes down to it, it's very difficult because yes. you start missing practices and you start missing games and choices have to be made and it's challenging. I don't know how to how to mix it any better. I want to give a special shout out to my friend Dana Cornelius. Dana's the CEO, co-owner of Sport of Kings, the, the gear that I am rocking today. Yes, folks, I do wear more than a blue suit, white shirt, and a tie. Check out their website, S O K fy.com if you drop in the word podium in the discount code they're going to send you an amazing 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 package of whatever you order with 20 percent off check it out sport of kings love dana and tiffany when do you think it changed from the parent respecting the coach's position, expertise, and responsibility to the student athletes where they wouldn't be as outspoken. When do you think it went from that? Because that's how I grew up. I mean, my high school football coach one time grabbed me by my collar and put me up against his garage and told me who was in charge when I said, well, that person's not going to play because they haven't practiced this week. He wanted to make sure I was clear that He's the head coach, he's and even as the captain, it's not up to me, yeah. and I should know my place, right? For To which I shared with my father when I got home, and he's like, I'm glad he did that. Yeah. Are you clear now? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm crystal clear <laughs> yeah. who's calling the starting lineup on Friday night, Yeah, right? To today, believe that coach I, would get fired. I can't believe how many parents stick around wanting to talk to the coach after the game. How does that even work? Like, what happened? Um the internet. It was the same for me when I was coaching. I was a strength coach at the University of Detroit Mercy. Which again, congratulations on that. I've had people comment about your time there and they say nothing but beautiful things about you as an influence. Wow. Thank you. I left there in 2002. So early 2000s before really cell phones were out and, and social media. And we could coach a certain way then kind of like what you were saying, you know, it, it was harder coaching, more demanding. It changed a lot when people started bringing out their phones and having opinions that differed from the coaches and they'd put it out there. And, and now the recruiting game for better or worse is all about kind of kissing the butts of kids who aren't even at the school because you want them to come there and you have to, like, I'm not saying that, that coaches, recruiters shouldn't do that. Like you have to, but that it is just different than it was 20 you know, 20 years ago, for better or worse, you know, probably in a lot of ways better. But I believe that that kids can get a lot more out of themselves if they have a coach that coaches them hard than somebody that just kind of lets them do what they want to do. But a lot of kids aren't used to that mm -hmm. these days. So it's just a, it's a different style, I think. Mm -hmm. But I, but I really think parents that want their kids to achieve long-term success, if they're really looking for that, they act like they want their kid to be the next LeBron James or the next Messi or whoever it is. If that's really the case, you got to let them do some other things or have them with a coach that's going to do those other things. And man, a lot of it's luck in the sense like, do you live in an area that has the right coach? And are the kids on the team kids that your kids like being around who are also taking it as seriously? And you can't manufacture that. My middle son had it like for gymnastics. I, I thought he was going to be going to, you know, go on forever in gymnastics. He had a great coach. Everything was perfect. And his coach died suddenly. And it just completely derailed everything. And you can't count on that. Like stuff happens, stuff changes. And people now are moving to other cities. Like they're taking their kid and moving them. There's no guarantee. There's no, you know, there's really no guarantee. And, and you have to kind of decide what do you want for your kid? Do you want your kid to be a division one athlete? Does your kid want to be a division one athlete? Because if your kid doesn't want to be a division one athlete, don't push it on them because it's, it's hard. It is really, it is really difficult. If your kid doesn't want to be there and they're just, they just happen to be good. It's going to be a long four years for them in college. I love that you just said that. That second question is the one that I, I, I find when I'm just listening to conversations of parents to parents at sporting events, I'm not always clearly seeing the child want 
through just observation as much as the parent wants, right? And so you made me think of a podcast I just listened to with Jay Shetty and Ed Milet. And Ed Milet was sharing with Jay Shetty that you have to have huge reasons and high standards. And, And ever since I listened to that several weeks ago, I've started auditing the environments I'm in and and thinking, does the person in front of me, and even when it's Avon Atlas, have a huge reason for wanting to do this? Because if I try to apply a high standard in the absence of a huge personal reason, it's going to get give me the completely opposite effect or outcome. And it'll probably ruin your relationship with them. <laughs> But, but when you have the kid who has, the term was coined a long time ago, ignition, like wow. their ignition was turned on at some point and they have that and they really want it. And you have the parent and the coach who are around them that are going to help support that and develop it. Well, that's where the magic occurs. People have asked me, cause I'll talk about ignition like through the IYCA and the parents will ask like, all right, so how do I create ignition? <laughs> Take them outside. Yeah, Let's like, see what they do. Go play with them. I mean, you can take them to a game. You can have them meet somebody. But just because I met somebody doesn't mean that I'm going to be want to be like them. You, you might want to turn me into a car driver and I meet Mario Andretti. That doesn't mean I'm going to want to be a car driver if I wanted to be Magic Johnson. So it's, yeah. it's, it's different for every kid. And it's just it's a magical puzzle of mush that you just don't always know how it's going to turn out. I appreciate those examples and I'm sure our listeners do too. I've been thinking about how many of the young men in and around the NFL retired, still active on the way off. We had a a couple guys on this year that are just entering the draft. So many young men I've had the privilege of meeting who've trained with you. And I hear a couple consistent things about simplicity, clarity, defining exactly what the expectation or the objective is for doing a drill or an exercise, just great communication, really helping them understand the why. I hear that kind of consistently from them. Even Benny Fowler, who now is an OG. Benny just retired a year ago and you know, eight years in the NFL, and he spoke so highly about you. That's how we first met. He trained with you all the way back from his days at Country Day through his years in the NFL. They say very similar, consistent messages about your impact, your influence as a mentor, advocate, and coach to them. Who helped shape that for you? First of all, that's very kind of you to say. And I do think that fundamentals, that's where the magic is. People think nowadays that you have to do these different things that nobody knows if they actually work. Yet we know that fundamentals do work, but they're not as sexy as doing different things that are made up and, and look cool. But fundamentals, that's where, that's where the magic is. It's, it's the, it's living in that, that consistent world of doing things over and over again to force your body to adapt and learn how to do it correctly. There's a reason that Steph Curry can shoot like he does. From what I understand, he wouldn't leave the gym until he made 10 shots in a row without hitting the rim. Even if he made the shot, if it hit the rim, he started over. You just don't get people who are willing to do that much of the same thing over and over again. But that's where the magic is. Jake Butt, he even at one point in his NFL career, he texted me and he said, hey, I'm gonna, I, I think I need to get back to the Jim K basics. I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. What do you recommend on this? And I was like, yeah, why? Like." That's what works. Like, do that. Like, yes. keep doing that. That is what's going to help you. And I just, I love hearing that kind of stuff. There's a lot of good coaches that I have worked with that I am not necessarily just like, but I will try to be a little bit like them. And then I, I do a lot of reading. I listen, you know, to a lot. Like, I, I never was around John Wooden, but John Wooden, I would say, is kind of a mentor of mine because I would read about how he would treat athletes with respect, but with clear boundaries and uh, expectations. And to me, that's always just like, been a huge part of what I what I do. There's a book called Getting the Best Out of Others that really helped me understand how important positive feedback was, uh, more so than the negative feedback in anything. Like, that's how you're going to get people to repeat a behavior is by explaining to them that they did it correctly and how they did it correctly. So in a lot of my coaching, I don't mind telling people like, oh, that one wasn't good. And just delivering information, like John Wooden always said, just deliver information without the personal attack. 
oh yeah, that one wasn't good because you, whatever, your foot landed in the wrong place. Oh, that one was good because X, Y, and Z, like telling them why they did it correctly. There was actually a coach named Walt Reynolds, who's a, who's a trainer. He was a high jumper at Oregon. And he was kind of the first strength coach, performance coach that kind of took me under his wing. He was doing one-on-one training in the East Lansing area when I was in school at Michigan State and really just kind of let me follow him around. And he had a real laid back style. And then when I got to University of Michigan, I got to work under Mike Gittleson, who was one of the first strength coaches in America. Very different style than Walt, but also very, just very direct. Like, no, that's not how you do it. Oh yeah, that's how you do it. And really hard on people, but people loved him. The players loved him because he was direct with them, but would also let them know when they did a good job. And Ken Manny, who was the strength coach at Michigan State forever, was very much the same. He talked about how hard he was. People always remember how hard he was on kids. But the kids also remember how much he loved them up when the time was right. So I tried to take that into a lot of a lot of what I did. And and I and I never minded Actually, I, I thought it was the right thing to do to kind of develop somewhat of a personal relationship with athletes. So I have athletes pouring, pouring out their deepest, darkest, darkest secrets because I, I like to listen. I feel like I can support them I'm in that way. Just based on a dozen or so of those young men that we have in common in our lives, like I could completely see that based on just how they've reflected about you in previous conversations it's a lot more than just you at impact. And I see the shirts everywhere. Like I was just at Ava's soccer game at Detroit Country Day last night, and there was a young man walking out of the weight room with like six student athletes locking up, and I, he was wearing impact sports performance. I'm guessing you have partners and teammates at impact that are impacting and developing young men and women all over Southeast Michigan. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about the story behind impact, the vision yeah. of where that came from, what it looks like today, and, and maybe the two to three areas that you and your team are just absolutely obsessed about being the best at? When I left University of Detroit, I helped open another training center up in Wixom. That was back in 2002 before sports performance was really a business. Instead of selling people on sports performance, we were trying to explain what the heck we were doing at, at that time. People literally didn't understand like why we were open. They didn't understand that we had the solution until people started getting results and then the word started spreading. Fast forward, before COVID, a hospital system purchased our training center. It was not a good fit. During COVID, obviously everything shut down and I asked them to terminate me actually so that I could get out of my contract. And, and they did, they were very good about it. And that's when we opened Impact. So yeah, so I opened an in-person training business during COVID. Pretty smart, huh? That, but all my staff came with me and they are amazing. I had a I had a list of names for the business and Impact was like kind of on the other list. And I was putting it out to my friends. What do you think of these names? Rank the names. And I gave my wife the, the results one night and she, she looked at me and she's like, why? Why are you, why do you keep bothering with these other names? And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, what does everybody say in like cards that they write you and text messages and phone calls and emails? They all say like, oh, what an impact you made on my life. What an impact you made on my career. What an impact you made on my sports career. She's like, that's the name. It's impact. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. So that's why we chose that. By by the way, my wife, she has this sixth sense, like gut feelings, like I've never experienced with any other human being in my life. I tried to fight it for a long time, but I've learned like when my wife thinks something and feels it yeah. like, okay, there's something there. Don't, don't mess with that. Okay. My whole staff jumped, jumped on board and we started getting after it. And one of our employees like put a camera in front of kids' faces and said, you know, what do you like most about impact? And like almost everybody mentioned something about how much the trainers care about them. And they, it's like a family atmosphere and they want us to do better. And I've had lots of comments about that from kids and families through the years. We want to make an impact on, on kids, not just run a faster 40, but have them enjoy sports better because they've trained with us. And I always call it like we need to create exceptional training experiences because if you have an exceptional training experience, you're going to enjoy sports more. You're going to develop confidence. And I've seen it now with my own kids. 
kids are going to go home. And if they're enjoying sports more, it's a much better atmosphere at home. When your kids are struggling in sports and there's a bad coach or they're feeling un, you know, not so confident, the dinner table is not the same. And you can't, the conversations you're having with your kids are just not the same. So having those exceptional experiences is something that we, we really pride ourselves on. And then really digging into the science. We have a lot of, lot of coaches and parents that will see us do our evaluations and kind of come up with our programs. And they're like, whoa, like I've never seen this. Like some just really cool things like Cody White that plays for the Steelers. Oh, sure. His dad, when he was working for the Lions, was referred to me from the Lions staff. And Cody came in, and I videotaped him doing his, you know, do, like accelerating because he had to run 40s for camps, for, for college recruiting camps. And then I, I broke it down, changed it, and did it. And Sheldon, the, the dad, was like, oh, my God, I've never seen anybody do that. And to us, th- my staff, we're like, well, this is just what we do. This is what we do. And it's really fun because it's mundane to us. It's fun to have somebody else come in and say like, wow, like I really appreciate this. And that kind of gets us going. And then we realize like, okay, well, if I'm doing this for the kid and I can also get a good experience and results, like this is going to be pretty, this is going to be pretty good. So that's kind of what we do. I can really appreciate that example you just gave with Cody White. I, I think sometimes as parents, where our intention is to give our children the very best of everything we can. But a lot of times we just don't even know what the best is. What are the things that the parents should be like looking out for that are maybe signs or leading indicators that say, hey, maybe they should reach out to Impact. Maybe they should sign up for an assessment. And I say this because I told you about my good buddy, David Kwan. He just put his son, Andrew, who I love, Andrew Kwan, Detroit Country Day. This kid's going to be the next Jeff Bezos. I and uh, I think the world of Andrew. And he just did his assessment with you and the team. And he came back with that same sort of like, like, aha, like, Wow. And here's a young man who's been playing sports at a very high level for a long time, as a 13-year-old, for a long time. And David, his dad, took him to Impact just last week, and he came back with, like, an aha moment. What should we be looking out for to know, hey, maybe we should reach out? Thank you for this amazing sales pitch. (laughs) Well, it just (laughs) happened. I know. I told told you I can't even get you out of my life. (laughs) Elena, I cannot get your husband out of my life. (laughs) <laughs> we get all the time parents calling saying, I know this might sound weird, but I think my kid runs funny. We all think that. Yeah. And every time I laugh, I'm like, that, no, that doesn't sound weird. Like I, we hear that all the time. Uh, the ability to run fast is a huge determinant in success in a lot of sports. So if kids are having trouble running not just fast, but smoothly and coordinated and being able to stop and start and turn and change direction. If they're having trouble with that, it decreases their enjoyment of sports. Even if they're just like, if you're the last person on every sprint or, you know, you're in the back, like that just, that takes a huge toll on kids. If you get them to go from last place in all the sprints to like middle of the pack, like that just takes a huge load of pressure off of kids. And they, and they start thinking like, oh, now I can concentrate on sports instead of just trying to hide. I know for myself, I had lots of, lots of experiences where I just tried to like get through things and, and hide so nobody noticed that I wasn't good at something and it didn't work out. Like I still can't kick very well with my left foot because when I played soccer, I tried to always just like get through the drills and not get better rather than like, let's, let's make mistakes. Let's, let's don't, let's not worry about like being judged. Let's make the mistakes over and over again until we can do them, do them better. So when you see kids who are, maybe they were having a really good time in sports and maybe something changed or, or or they're not the same athlete that they used to be, or you see that they have some aspirations, if they are expressing interest, then that's also a great time. We don't, we don't start before eight years old, but like, it's kind of never too early as long as you're not overdoing it. Like, I don't want to see an eight-year-old five times a week. That's, that's too much. But when athletes are kind of taking it seriously, they really get into, into the training and it helps them 
focus better on the field or on the court as well because they feel like they're doing the work they're supposed to be doing. They're learning how to focus and, and create some intensity. I guess those would be the things. Don't have your kid come in when they're a senior in high school and they're not good at sports and say like, hey, can you make my kid a division one athlete? That's a little bit late, sorry. We can make them better. Maybe not exactly like that, but yeah, there are some unreasonable expectations of thinking that, you know, we're gonna, you know, in, in six weeks, we're gonna turn somebody into something that they're just not going to be. Share with our listeners another unrealistic mom or dad expectation that you've been a part of. Why isn't my kid getting division one football scholarships or why isn't my kid, you know, like getting X, Y, or Z. And they're coming to you for that. Sometimes they're asking, sometimes they're frustrated. I do hear more from kids. My coach just doesn't like me and that's why he doesn't play me, which maybe that happens sometimes, but a lot of times coaches are going to play you if you're good. And you're a good teammate. Right? Like if you're a good collaborator on the field during the game. I always have to then start unpacking it for them. Like, well, when when did you start feeling that way? And what do you think you did? And and I will say that a lot of it does come down to communication. Kids can get put in a doghouse really fast. If a kid shows up at, say, college or in, in high school or a club sport and they do something wrong, like coaches don't forget that for a long time. Once you get put in the doghouse, I do think it's very important to have a conversation with the coach and say like, hey, I know I did this. Like you got to put stuff out there and and be honest. I think that that goes a long way, you know? So yeah, I don't know if that helps anybody, but yeah, if you're if you feel like your kid's in the doghouse or you're in the doghouse, at some point you have to reflect on yourself and feel figure out like, what did I do? My whole life goes back to the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I, I cannot change. Yeah. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And the wisdom to know the difference is the real key there. That's right. Because if you think you're gonna control things that you can't control, you're gonna be super frustrated. And if you don't do something about something you can do. Then you just wanna complain about it. You gotta own that. Gotta own it. Yeah. You gotta own it. So. That's kind of how I try to live a lot of my life. Like, if there's a problem, I always try to say, okay, well, what did I do here? Sure. What can I control? How can I work with somebody to, you know, to make this a better situation? And if you don't do that, you're going to be pretty frustrated and bitter and carry around a lot of resentment probably in your life. I'm noticing more and more on the podcast page on Instagram, I'm starting to see high school student athletes start to follow the podcast. That's awesome. From like middle school through pro sports and a lot of retired guys and gals who follow these conversations, whether it's the young Andrew Kwan Atlas Amesqua that's 13 years old playing multiple sports at Country Day or some of these guys playing on the field today like a Tyler Conklin, an Anthony Pittman, a Khalif Raymond. What are two or three of the things that you say You've got to be doing this on your own when you're not training to get the most performance when you're on the field. What are those basics that maybe you bring forward as a priority for these young men and women to do on their own when they're not at practice or in a game? Sleep is a huge huge thing. And in fact, there's, there are studies showing that if you go from lack of sleep to having enough sleep, almost as big of effect as what like steroids would do for some people as, as far as wow. being able to recover. And a lot of kids, my own kids included and myself included, don't get enough sleep for aging, even for aging, like for people who are worried about that, which, you know, I am at this point in my life, like a lack of sleep can really mess up your body's ability to recover and, and maintain youthfulness. So sleep is huge. And I think a lot of people pride themselves on like, oh, I don't need to sleep. I'll grind, you know, I'll wake up early. I'll go to bed late and put more hours in, but that takes a huge toll on you. So sleep is a big one. Fueling your body properly. I think everybody knows now Maybe they don't know exactly what to put in their body, but they know what not to put in their body. I think most kids, you know, athletes know like going to McDonald's and drinking a large pop and fries like isn't your best choice. Maybe you don't know exactly what to eat, but you know what not to eat. So trying to moderate that. I'm a big moderation guy. Balances a lot of things for, for me. So also balancing how much training time you're putting in and how much energy. There's only there's only so much recovery pie. So you want to be efficient 
You want to do the things that are going to give you the most bang for your buck so that you can recover from those things and pick the right things. You don't need to beat the brakes off of yourself every single day. I think that there's this mentality that people are like addicted to fatigue in yes. the sense like, oh, if I don't, if I'm not puking every single workout, like I'm not working hard enough. Well, <laughs> you don't have to be like that every single day. That's going to break you down. So taking time off. I never would have said that before, but today I feel like kids are, they're, they're on, they're on social media so much and they see these things and they, they feel like I got to be killing myself every single day. And you know, two months down the road, they're like, I don't even feel like doing anything. Okay. Like a little moderation, do the right things for a short period of time and then recover. Take some, take a day off. That's okay. Or do something really, you know, really light. I guess then the three, the three simple secrets are show up on time where you're supposed to be prepared for what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Listen to directions and follow them to the best of your ability. And then give, give as much effort as you possibly can on everything you do. Yes. Those three things, like I, those are like, those are gold to me. And I, and I try to instill those in athletes because especially today, the second one, listening to directions and following them to the best of their ability, that seems really challenging. It, it's very difficult for kids to, to listen to directions and follow them these days for whatever reason. And giving, giving all out in te, you know, effort. Yeah, empty the tank every time. That's really hard. Kyle Vandenbosch, who is like he, one of the greatest football players ever. I had guys on the Lions sitting around one day talking about how amazing he is and everything. And, and I said, okay, you guys know what he does, you know, and you want to be like him. Why don't you, you, you see what he does. Just why don't you do it? Everybody. It's too hard. It's too hard. It's really hard to do, to, you know, to, to be, to give that intensity every single day and, and to maintain it. So the more you can, the, the better. I think you're going to, people are going to get better results out of anything they do in their lives. You made a comment that I think you might have an opinion on, but you didn't give it. And it was why you believe that maybe young student athletes don't listen as well today. Do you, do you have a perspective on that? I have children that I want to give my best to. You know, I'm consistently working on my self-awareness and ensuring that my personal disappointments playing Division three sports are not the reason why I work with my children on their huge reasons and high standards. Yeah. I don't want to be that parent. I'm not saying it's wrong. Yeah. It's who I don't want to be. On that note, I think every parent and coach should read or listen to Joe Ehrman's book, Inside Out Coaching. Joe Ehrman was an NFL legend, goes around the country yes. talking about positive coaching. And what he says about that very topic is quite amazing. I think it's difficult to listen to directions and follow them. It's more difficult for kids today because they are so inundated with short messages that are often meaningless. How many kids do you see on their phone and just reels? Bam, 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 bam. And so many of the things that they're watching are completely meaningless. So they almost learn to tune out and they need something bigger to wake them up than what they should need. Mm -hmm. So they kind of just start to tune things out. I see it all the time. I'll, uh, I'll be working with a bunch of kids. I'll give directions and I can look around and, and I sometimes I'll say like, you have no idea what I just said. And they're like, yeah, I, like they're gone. Being present, that's something that I had to learn by, by working with a therapist years ago because I was constantly in my own head living somewhere else and thinking about other things. But being present is a skill that I think is really challenging for, for kids and, and for anybody. Adults. Everybody. I struggle with it. I, I struggled with it for years. And I still do. I still do. But, you know, being able to, to stay in what you're doing instead of thinking about other things is just a skill that maybe kids don't have. Kids can't even stand in line for anything. And I feel bad for them. I think that parents in this generation, we, we didn't know what phones and what the internet and all that stuff was going to do. And now we're sure. seeing it and it's hard to rein it back in. But like, my, my youngest kid, he knows he should be off of his phone more and like agrees like, yeah, you know, I, I think that's a good idea, but it's hard to do because it's just part of what they do. They get bored a lot easier, I think. I enjoyed hearing that perspective and obviously the the book Inside Out Coaching by Joe Ehrman. Look it up. I mean, that, that, that'll be a great read. Coach, as we wrap up, 
the vision for impact sports performance. Where is your organization three to five years from now? That's a great question. And a couple of the guys that work for me, we, we talk about that. Yeah. I have some big goals, but I've become more patient in as I've gotten a little bit older and I kind of wait for the right timing of things now. I used to force things and now I ha- now I kind of try to wait for, oh, the opportunity's there. All right, we're ready for it. Let's, let's strike. Yeah. So finding the, I have to find the right people to grow even further. And I'm kind of doing that right now, kind of planting the seeds. We have three locations right now, and I can see us having maybe two more, okay. but each one of them yeah. getting bigger and doing more stuff online so we can impact people outside of our direct radius. Sure. I think that what we're doing is really special. So I, I want to do more of it rather than trying to switch things up too much. Maybe at some point I'll, I'll switch things up, but that's kind of the vision right now. Where are the three locations? And for parents, collegiate student athletes or pro athletes today, but where are the locations and how do these folks reach out to engage with your team if they've not worked with Impact Sports Performance yet? So our main place is in Novi. Yes. Then we have one in Brighton and one in East Lansing. They can reach out through our website. There's a form they can contact us. The phone numbers are on there as well. We're super parent friendly. So we get like how scheduling works. Everything's quite flexible. We start off with the evaluation. So that's kind of how we start everything out. And that helps us guide what we're going to do with each athlete. So it's it's pretty user friendly. So if somebody reaches out, we explain like, all right, here's what's going to happen, and we make sure that we get them in as soon as we can, and then get them rolled into this into the system. All three of the locations can can handle whatever people need. Awesome. And the website is impact sportsperformance dot com. And if folks wanted to reach out to you or keep up on all the great work you're doing with these athletes, uh, what's the simplest way to stay up on who you are? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Instagram? What's your preference? My Instagram. On Instagram, we do impact stuff and IYCA yeah. stuff too, but that's kind of where I usually live. Not so much Facebook. Don't messenger me on Facebook. I might not see it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, love being with you today. I'm going to do a shameless plug for two friends of mine right now because we did talk about sleep. All right. And these guys are obsessed about helping people with their performance and wellness and really founded in sleep. Rhett Taylor's got a business based out of Colorado called NED, N-E-D. And he recently sent me a few things he suggested I start taking because my sleep is atrocious. I've got a brain that never shuts down. So I want to give a shout out to Rhett Taylor and Ned. Folks can check that out on Instagram. And then my buddy Todd Anderson, who played for Coach D'Antonio. He's got the mask. Yeah, he just launched a company called Dream Recovery. So we flew him out to talk to the team. And he talked to us all about sleep and all these other things. Moderation was one of them as well. And the consistency of, of doing a little little bit versus doing three really hard workouts, but dream recovery, incredible Todd Anderson, check them out on Instagram. If you're into what we talked about today, all great guys and coach, it was just an absolute privilege to be with you one-on-one. Yeah, man, this was awesome. And and thanks for doing this. This podcast has been awesome. Like my staff listens to it. You've really brought some good people on and it's, it's entertaining the way you clip it up and put it out there. You've done a really, really good job with this. Thanks for saying that because I think a lot of people think I'm very one dimensional as a guy in financial services and a financial advocate to clients. So thanks for saying you enjoy the podcast. I got a question for you though. Yeah. Cause I've asked people, I'm like, why is he doing this? This is a lot of time. <laughs> like he doesn't have to do this and everybody, and, and, and there seems to be no like reason other than like, you just like it and you want to put good stuff out there, it, which I think is amazing. I appreciate you saying that. I think I've always been obsessed about high performers in the world of sports. And I have met many, many very successful people in business. And one of the most common characteristics about their childhood and their journey into boardrooms and CEO offices and being a incredibly successful entrepreneur or philanthropist was a childhood in sports. And I've just found that some of the most successful humans in the world are recovering athletes whether they finished in high school, college, or in the pros. And so I love peeling back the layers on the story of your life, your why, the core values, the beliefs, the tactical systems for executing at a high level and packaging those up into lessons that we can all learn from. And selfishly, I'm weekly learning from the guests in the other chair and taking notes 
and applying things forward in my life and in the lives of the people you know around me so it's a great reason yeah appreciate you it's been great folks thanks so much for listening and thanks to my guest jim kilbasso connect with jim on instagram at jim kilbasso k-i-e-l-b-a-s-o if you like what you heard today please be sure to follow rate and review at the podium on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcasts you can follow the show on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at podium underscore podcast. Post about the show and tag us, and we'll repost to share our gratitude. Also, as always, please consider telling a friend about the show. Friend to friend is still the best way to get the word out and share these great conversations with some of the best in the world of sports. See you next time.